Welcome back. Let's practice sketching quadric surfaces in 3D space. All right, so here's our first example. We want to sketch the surface represented by this equation. We have 4x squared plus 9y squared plus 16z squared minus 576 is equal to zero. Okay, so the first thing we have to do here before we can sketch this surface is identify the type of surface that this equation represents. And for one thing, we know it's not going to be a cylinder, right? Cylinder equations only involve two variables. This equation involves three. And that's going to be the case for all of these examples because we are going to be sketching quadric surfaces, not cylinders, okay? So we know we have three variables, that's good. Another thing that I notice here is that all three of those variables are squared, right? So that's good. I'm gonna write that down. We have all squared variables, now, another thing I notice is that each of those variable terms are all positive, right? None of them are negative. We have positive 4x squared, positive 9y squared, and positive 16z squared. That is another thing that you want to identify, the signs of your variable terms. In this case, they are all positive. And then finally, one more thing that I notice here is that this equation has a constant term. Now, right now it's negative, but that's because it's on this side of the equation. If we added 576 to both sides of the equation, then we would have a positive constant term. So that's fine. The most important thing to notice here is that we do have a constant term. So there is a constant. So from these three things, we can make a conclusion about the type of surface that this equation represents. Specifically, these three features match up with what the equation looks like for an ellipsoid, all right, or essentially an ellipse in 3D. That is the type of quadric surface that we are working with here. However, we can't quite sketch it yet because this equation is not in standard form. We want our equations in standard form to help us more easily sketch our quadric surfaces. So let's do that here. The first thing we will want to do is add the constant term over to the other side of the equation. So if we do that, we'll have 4x squared plus 9y squared plus 16z squared is equal to 576. But now remember, in the standard equation for an ellipsoid, the sum of all the variable terms should be equal to one. So to get one on this side of the equation, we want to divide both sides of the equation by 576. So let's do that here. We'll have 4x squared divided by 576 plus 9y squared divided by 576 plus 16z squared divided by 576. And then of course, 576 divided by itself is one. That was the whole reason we did this. Okay, now each of these fractions will simplify. Four divided by 576 will reduce to one divided by 144. So you'll have x squared divided by 144 plus nine divided by 576 will reduce to 1 64th. So you'll have y squared divided by 64. And then finally, 16 divided by 576 will reduce to 1 36th. So we'll have z squared divided by 36 equals one. Okay, and now the equation of our surface is in standard form. And you can clearly see that it would represent an ellipse. All the variable terms are positive, all the variables are squared, and it's equal to one. Okay, so now we can sketch our ellipsoid. To do that, remember that all of the traces for an ellipsoid will be ellipses. So that means in each of the coordinate planes, the xy, the yz, and the xz, the traces for this surface will be ellipses, okay? And we can sketch those pretty easily by identifying the intercepts for the x, y, and z axes by looking at the values in the denominator of their respective terms in the equation. Right, so the square root of 144 would be the x-intercepts, the square root of 64 would be the y-intercepts, and the square root of 36 would be the z-intercepts. Okay, so I'll write that down. The intercepts for these ellipses would be x equals plus or minus 12, y equals plus or minus 8, and z equals plus or minus 6. And again, that's just because we could rewrite our equation like this. We would have x squared divided by 12 squared plus y squared divided by eight squared plus z squared divided by six squared equals one, okay? Those values of 12, eight, and six are where we get our intercepts from for x, y, and z. 
All right, so now let's plot those intercepts in this coordinate system. Just a reminder that this only works because this ellipsoid is centered at the origin. We know that because we just have x squared, y squared, and z squared in this equation. It's not x minus one squared or y plus two squared or z minus three squared, right? There's no extra values being added or subtracted from x, y, and z in those squared quantities. It's just the actual variable squared, which means that the ellipsoid is centered at the origin. Okay, and that will be the case for the majority of quadric surfaces that you are expected to sketch a graph of. You could certainly still sketch a graph if they were centered at another point, but it is a little bit trickier. These values would not necessarily be intercepts, they would tell you how far away from the center point the ellipses would be measured out in the x, y, and z directions. Okay, but anyway, in this case we are centered at the origin, so we are going to be labeling our intercepts along each of the axes. For x we have plus or minus 12, so I'll say that this is x equals positive 12 and this is x equals negative 12. Then for y we have plus or minus 8, so I'll say that this is positive 8 and this is negative 8. And then for z we have plus or minus 6, so I'll say that right about here is z equals positive 6 and this is z equals negative 6. All right, and then to actually sketch our ellipsoid here, what we want to do is draw a trace of an ellipse in each of the coordinate planes. So let's start with the xy plane. To draw that ellipse, we will need to connect the x and y intercepts. So I'll start at the negative y intercept here, connect to the positive x, go out to the positive y, come out to the negative x, and then come back to the negative y. All right, so that's one ellipse. Now let's draw an ellipse in the yz plane. And so for that ellipse, we're going to be connecting the y and z intercepts. So I'll start at the positive z intercept, come out to the positive y, go down to the negative z, up to the negative y, and then back to the positive z. So there's our second ellipse. And then finally, we want to draw an ellipse in the xz plane, the only plane we haven't worked with yet. So we want to connect the x-intercepts and the z-intercepts. So I'll start at the positive z-intercept. We'll come down to the positive x, and then out to the negative z, back up to the negative x, and then back to the positive z. Okay, so those are the three traces for our ellipsoid. We now have our three ellipses drawn. Now these are just the three traces. There would be an actual shape formed by all of these ellipses, which you can sort of get that by drawing an ellipse around everything like I'm going to do here. So you kind of round out the edges. Basically anywhere where it looks like things are not really round, you sort of just want to complete that. And then you get about the shape of your ellipsoid. Okay, so to finish it off, I'm going to shade it in. And once you've done that, it should look something like this. That really helps it pop out of the page. This is probably one of the easiest quadric surfaces to sort of visualize on your own. But if you need some additional help visualizing it, here is a 3D render of what this ellipsoid would look like in 3D space. Sort of brings our sketch to life. That's what we drew a picture of in our 3D coordinate system. But with that, that is it for this example. And so let's move on to the next one. For our next example, we want to sketch the surface represented by this equation. We have 25y squared plus 16z squared equals x squared. Okay, so the first thing I notice about this equation is that we do have three variables, x, y, and z, but more specifically, all three of them are squared, right? We have x squared, y squared, and z squared. So that's good. We have all squared variables, okay? Another thing I notice is that they are all positive, or are they, right? Initially, it looks like they're all positive, but they're not all on the same side of the equation, so we can't make that conclusion yet. So before we try to make any other conclusions about this equation or about what type of surface it represents, let's try to get it in a more familiar format that would be similar to a standard equation of a quadric surface, and we can do that by subtracting x squared from both sides of the equation, right? So if we did that, we'd have negative x squared plus 25y squared plus 16z squared equals zero. Okay, so now we can see clearly not all of the variable terms are positive. One of them is negative, in particular the x term. All right, so we have one negative term. And then one other thing that I notice here is that we have no constant, right? These three variable terms are equal to zero and there's no other constant term for us to add over there. 
so that it's not zero, right? It is zero and it will stay zero. So we have no constant. And that's big because that should immediately tell you exactly what surface is represented by this equation. If all the variables are squared and there's no constant and one of those variable terms is negative, that for sure has to be an elliptic cone. An elliptic cone is the only quadric surface where the three variable terms are equal to zero, where there is no constant term, and where all three variables are squared. So we now know that this is for sure an elliptic cone, but we don't quite have our equation in standard form yet. We're really close. We have our three variable terms equal to zero, but we have two constant multiples for y squared and z squared that we kind of need to get rid of. We want all of our variable terms to be divided by some value, right? In the standard equation, you have x squared divided by a squared, y squared divided by b squared, z squared divided by c squared. That's what's going on in the standard equation. And so that's the form that we want to try to get this equation in. And in order to do that, we can divide by any number we'd like. Because in this case, the other side of the equation is just zero. So you can divide zero by anything you'd like, except zero, of course, and the answer will still be zero. So we can try to pick a nice number here that will allow 25 and 16 to disappear from being coefficients of y squared and z squared and instead just have some number in the denominator. And the easiest way to do that is to find a common multiple of those two coefficients. And that seems a little bit tricky at first for those two numbers, but if you ever get stuck, just multiply them together and that will give you a common multiple. And 25 times 16 is 400. So if we divide both sides of the equation by 400, here's what we'll get. We'll have negative x squared divided by 400 plus 25y squared divided by 400 plus 16z squared divided by 400, and that will be equal to zero because zero divided by 400 is just zero. Okay, so now 25 divided by 400 reduces to 1 16th and 16 divided by 400 reduces to 1 25th. Okay, so here's what we'll get next. We'll have negative x squared divided by 400 plus y squared divided by 16 plus z squared divided by 25, and that still equals zero. All right, and now our equation is in standard form for the equation of an elliptic cone. Now what we need to do is actually use it to help us sketch this surface. And one thing that you wanna make sure to identify here is the direction axis, right? Which of these axes, the x, y, or z, is the elliptic cone going to be directed along? And the way you determine that is by using the odd man out strategy, right? If you're looking at your equation, which variable is the odd one out? Well, two of them are positive and only one of them is negative. So the negative variable term would be the odd one out. So that would be the X variable in this case, which means that our cone, our elliptic cone, will be directed along the X axis, okay? So that's very helpful. We know that this will be directed along X axis. Okay, so now that we know that, what we want to do is find some traces in some planes along the x-axis that will help us sketch this elliptic cone. And the way we do that is by setting that variable of x from the direction axis. We want to set that equal to some nice values that will allow us to find some equations for traces of ellipses, all right? Because whatever axis you are directed along, the traces that would be in planes along that axis will be ellipses. Okay, and two nice values that we could plug in for x that would make some nice ellipse equations would be 20 and negative 20, right? If you plug in 20, 20 squared is 400. So you'd have negative 400 divided by 400, which would just become negative one. And the same thing would happen for negative 20 because negative 20 squared is the same as 20 squared. So if we do that, if we look at x equals plus or minus 20, here's the equation we will get. We'll have negative 400 divided by 400 plus y squared divided by 16 plus z squared divided by 25 equals zero. But negative 400 divided by 400, as I said, is just negative one. So you could just add one to the other side of the equation. And this is what you would get. You would have y squared divided by 16 plus z squared divided by 25 is equal to one. And that is the equation of an ellipse in a plane parallel to the y, z plane. Specifically, we're going to be drawing ellipses whose y-intercepts would be the square root of 16, so that would be plus or minus 4, and z-intercepts would be the square root of 25, so that would be plus or minus 5. 
And when I say intercepts, I'm not really talking about where they cross in the yz plane per se, because we are looking at x equals plus or minus 20, not x equals zero, which would be the yz plane. Instead, I'm talking about the intercepts of a projected yz plane at the value of x equals positive 20 and negative 20. I'll show you what I mean in just a second, but the intercepts for these ellipses are y equals plus or minus four and z equals plus or minus five. Okay, so now if we label x equals 20 and negative 20 on the x-axis here, I'll say that this is x equals positive 20 and this is x equals negative 20. At each of those points, what we wanna do is draw a new coordinate system, essentially a projected yz plane, all right? Because traces parallel to the yz plane will be ellipses when your elliptic cone is directed along the x-axis, all right? It's directed along the x-axis, so the plane involving the other two variables is the plane that would have ellipses parallel to it, all right? So at each of these points, I'm going to draw a new z-axis and y-axis, and so they should look something like this. And then what we want to do is just label the intercepts as if these two planes were the yz planes. All right, so I'll say that y equals 4 is right here, y equals negative 4 is right there, and then z equals 5 is up here, and z equals negative 5 is down there. Do your best to keep the same scaling. However the scaling would have been for the original yz plane, try to keep that the same for these projected planes, all right? I'm sort of eyeballing it because I'm not labeling each individual number or each individual value. I just label 20 and then four and five. So mine's not super precise, but try to be as accurate as you can in your own sketch. It'll make your drawing look a lot nicer. But then I'm going to label the same intercepts down here, okay? So now let's draw our ellipses. We just need to connect all these intercepts in both planes. So I'll start with this one. Here's one of our ellipses, and then I'll draw one down here as well. We'll connect all of those intercepts for our other ellipse. And now that we have drawn our two ellipses, what we need to do is finish off this sketch of an elliptic cone by drawing lines from the ellipses that cross through the origin, okay? Because this is an elliptic cone centered at the origin because we just have x squared, y squared, and z squared. We don't have any numbers being added or subtracted from x, y, or z in those squared quantities, all right? So the elliptic cone is centered at the origin, which means that the two cones that are going to be created for this surface will meet at the origin, all right? So you can draw your lines like this, and like this. And there you have it. That is our elliptic cone, but of course you might wanna shade it in to help it pop off the page a little bit. So I'll do that now. And there we have it. That is my final sketch of this elliptic cone. If you need help visualizing it, here's a 3D render of what it actually looks like in 3D space. Pretty close to our sketch, right? They look pretty similar, or at least they should if you drew your sketch correctly, okay? But with that, that is it for this example. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so for this example, we wanna sketch the surface represented by this equation. We have y equals negative seven x squared minus 14 z squared. The first thing I notice here is that we do have three variables. We have x, y, and z, but notice that only two of them are squared, right? x is squared and z is squared, but not y. y is to the first power. It is a degree one variable, and there are only two quadric surfaces where this happens. It's going to be some type of paraboloid. It's either going to be an elliptic paraboloid or a hyperbolic paraboloid. Which one of those two it is depends on the structure of the rest of this equation, all right? For an elliptic paraboloid, both of these squared variable terms should be positive, and for the hyperbolic paraboloid, only one of the squared variable terms should be negative, all right? So one is positive, one is negative. But if you look at our equation here, None of those things seems to be true, right? We have two negative squared variable terms. So what do we do about that? Well, what we could do is multiply both sides of this equation by negative one, right? So if we did that, we would have negative y is equal to positive seven x squared plus 14 z squared. And now we have an equation that is in the form of an elliptic paraboloid. Okay, both of our squared variable terms are positive and we have a negative degree one variable, which is fine, that can happen. All that negative sign does is tells us a little bit more about the direction of this elliptic paraboloid. 
all right? So make sure to write these things down so you know why we are making the conclusions that we are making. So I'll write this down. We have two squared variables, but one degree one, and then both squared are positive. And then finally, there is one more thing that we did learn from this equation. When you're working with elliptic paraboloids, the degree one variable tells you your direction axis. In this case, y is to the first power. So this paraboloid will be directed along the y axis, but in particular, because it is negative y, we will be directed towards the negative y axis. All right, the elliptic paraboloid will open up towards the negative side of the y axis. So we will be open towards negative y axis. All right, so that's the other important thing you wanna make a note of here. But altogether, we know from all of this that we are working with an elliptic paraboloid, okay? So now we need to work on trying to sketch it. And before we do any of that, since we know we're really only going to be working with the negative side of the y axis, I'm going to adjust my 3D coordinate system here a little bit. I just moved my x and z axes over a little bit so that we have a lot more space to work with in the negative y direction. That's just gonna be helpful with drawing a better sketch. You don't have to do this if you're following along, but I'm going to do that so that my sketch looks a lot nicer for you. But then to actually sketch the elliptic paraboloid, what we wanna do is find one trace of an ellipse that would be in a plane parallel to the x, z plane. Right, because we are directed along the y axis, the ellipses for the elliptic paraboloid will be in planes parallel to the x, z plane, the plane formed by the axes that are not the direction axis. Now, something interesting about this equation is that there is no extra constant term, right? There is no plus two or minus three or plus seven or anything like that. It's just negative y equals these two squared variable terms. So what that means is that this elliptic paraboloid is not shifted in any way. The vertex, or where it starts, will be the origin. It will start at the origin and then open up towards the negative y axis. And so since it's going to start at the origin, we can't plug in zero for y to find a trace of an ellipse. We'll have to plug some other value along the negative y axis to find the equation of an ellipse that would be one of the traces for the paraboloid. And so you wanna pick some value of y that would be nice to work with when forming your ellipse equation. And in this case, notice that we have both seven and 14. A common multiple of those two numbers would be 14. So that's what I'm going to use here, specifically negative 14, right? You always wanna pick a number in the direction that your elliptic paraboloid is opening up towards. So we're looking at negative y values here. So if I let y equal negative 14, here's what we'll get. We'll have positive 14 is equal to seven x squared plus 14 z squared, right? It's positive 14 because we're plugging in a negative number for negative y, so the two negatives cancel out. And then we're really close to having the equation of an ellipse. We just need to divide both sides by 14 to get this constant to be one. So if we do that, we'll have one equals seven x squared divided by 14 plus 14 z squared divided by 14. But then that simplifies to one equals x squared divided by two plus z squared. Or you could write it like this, you could have z squared divided by one. All right, so now you have the equation of an ellipse. This will be the trace in the plane at y equals negative 14 for this elliptic paraboloid. Specifically, it's an ellipse with x-intercepts of plus or minus the square root of two and plus or minus the square root of one, which would just be plus or minus one. So for this ellipse, the intercepts, or in other words, the distance in the x and z direction our x equals plus or minus the square root of two, which is approximately 1.4 or plus or minus 1.4, and then z equals plus or minus one. Okay, so what we wanna do here is label y equals negative 14 on our y-axis here. I'm gonna say it's all the way out here. This is negative 14 along the y-axis. And then at that point, we wanna draw a projection of the x, z plane. All right, we just wanna draw a coordinate system at that point. So we'll draw a z-axis and an x-axis. Do your best to make sure that they are parallel to their actual axes. But then what we can do is treat these as if they were the z and x axes to plot these intercepts and then draw our ellipse. So in the x direction, we'll have plus or minus the square root of two or 1.4. So I'll say that this is about negative 1.4 and this is positive 1.4. 
and then for z we have plus or minus one. So I'll label those as well. We'll say that this is z equals one and this is z equals negative one. And then we can draw an ellipse by connecting those intercepts. So it'll look something like this. It's a pretty small ellipse, but I'm trying to keep the scale as accurate as possible. Remember that we are negative 14 out from the origin. So in comparison, a radius of one and 1 1.4 is not all that big. Okay, so this is about what you would expect. But now that we've drawn that ellipse, we can finish off this elliptic paraboloid by just drawing a parabola from the ellipse to the origin. All right, so that would look something like this. It's gonna be pretty skinny. It's a thin elliptic paraboloid. It almost makes the shape of like half of a cucumber or half of a pickle, if you wanna think about it like that. Remember that this is just a surface though. There's no volume, there's nothing inside of it. So in that way, it's not like a pickle or a cucumber, but I'm just talking about the general shape of the surface. And to help the surface sort of pop out of the page a little bit, I'll shade it in. And that would be our elliptic paraboloid. Okay, once again, I'll put up a 3D render on the screen that you can compare to our sketch. You can see what that surface would really look like in 3D space. But with that, that is it for this example. Let's move on to the next one. Hey there, real quick, before we take a look at the next example, if you find my tutorial videos here at JK Math to be helpful, then I'd invite you to join my membership site, JK Math Plus, where you get access to many perks, including bonus content and my exclusive community. The bonus content includes dark mode versions of my videos, extra example problems, and more, while the community is a private space online where you can post questions, have discussions, and study together with me and other members. To learn how to join and see a full list of everything you'd get access to as a member, you can head over to jkmathematics.com plus. I will have a link for that in the description of this video. Okay, so if you're interested in becoming a member, feel free to check that out. It's a great way to support me and the tutorials I make, as well as a great way for you to learn math better. But for now, let's take a look at the next example. All right, so for this example, we wanna sketch the surface represented by this equation. We have three y squared plus four z squared minus two x squared equals 12. And what we need to do is identify the type of surface that this equation represents. First thing I notice is that we do have three variables, x, y, and z, and all three of them are squared. Okay, so I will write that down, all squared. But now take a look at the sign of these variable terms. Both y and z are positive, but the x term is negative, right? We have negative 2x squared. So one of them is negative. So I'll write that down. We have one negative term, and it is valid for us to make that conclusion at this point. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of equation manipulation before you can make that conclusion, but this one is pretty close to already being in standard form. We have our three variable terms equal to some constant term, and that constant term is positive. The only thing that we would need to do to get this into standard form is divide by that value of 12 so that this would be equal to one. But before we do that, that does bring me to the third thing I notice here, which is that we do have a constant term. So that's good. We now know that we have three squared variable terms. One of them is negative and we have a constant in the equation, which are the three things that you would expect to see in an equation that represent a hyperboloid of one sheet, okay? When all your variables are squared and only one of them is a negative term and you have a constant, it's always a hyperboloid of one sheet. If you had these same conditions, but instead of one negative term, there were two, then you would have a hyperboloid of two sheets, but in this case, there's only one negative term, so it's a hyperboloid of one sheet, okay? That's our conclusion here. Now, what axis will this hyperboloid be directed along? Well, it's always based on the odd man out, okay? If you're looking at our variable terms here, two are positive, one is negative, and the negative one is the odd one out, right? It's the only one that's negative, and so that would be the x term, which means that this hyperboloid of one sheet will be directed along the x axis, okay? So I'm going to write that down as well. It is directed along the x axis, okay? So that's good to make a note of as well. Now, what we want to do to actually sketch this surface or sketch this hyperboloid of one sheet is get the equation in standard form, which, as I mentioned earlier, we can do pretty quickly if we just divide both sides of the equation by 12. All right, so if we do that, we'll have 3y squared divided by 12 plus 4z squared divided by 12 minus 2x squared divided by 12 equals 1. All right, now 3 twelfths reduces to 1 fourth, 
4 twelfths reduces to 1 third, and 2 twelfths reduces to 1 sixth. So we will have y squared divided by 4 plus z squared divided by 3 minus x squared divided by 6 equals 1. Okay, and so now that we have our equation in standard form, what we want to do is use it to help us sketch this hyperboloid in our 3D coordinate system here. And the way we're going to do that is by finding three traces, specifically three traces of ellipses. And the way we do that is by first setting our negative variable, all right, the odd one out, you wanna set that equal to zero, and you'll get one equation, which will be an ellipse in the yz plane, and then we'll get two more traces by setting x equal to a convenient value, specifically a value that when we plug it in will be divisible by six so that we get a nice equation to work with. So let's work on that. Let's start by setting x equal to zero. And if you set that equal to zero, that whole term is gone, right? Zero squared divided by six is just zero. So the equation would be y squared divided by four plus z squared divided by three equals one. And that is very clearly the equation of an ellipse where the y-intercepts would be plus or minus two, the square root of four, and the z-intercepts would be the square root of three, which would be plus or minus the square root of three. All right, so from this, we have an ellipse where the distance along the y-axis from the center is equal to plus or minus two. And for z, it's equal to plus or minus the square root of three, which is approximately 1.7 as a decimal. Okay, so that's one of our traces. That's one of our ellipses. I will write that in parentheses. This is an ellipse. But then we wanna find two more traces by picking some nice values of x to plug in to this term. Usually you just wanna pick the value that would be the square root of the denominator. So in this case, you would take the square root of six. And so that's what I'll use here. We'll have x equals plus or minus the square root of six. I'm using plus or minus, that way we get two traces and they will give us the same ellipse because we'll be squaring that value of x. So it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, you're gonna get the same thing. All right, so when x is equal to plus or minus the square root of six, which by the way, as a decimal, that is about 2.4. So just keep that in mind when we go to draw these traces. But if x is equal to plus or minus the square root of six, you're going to have the square root of six squared, so you'll have six divided by six for that term. All right, so you're going to have y squared divided by four plus z squared divided by three minus six divided by six equals one, but six divided by six is one, so you'd have negative one, and then you would wanna combine that with the other constant, so you would add one to both sides of the equation. So you would get this, you would have that these two terms are equal to two. But now the standard form for the equation of an ellipse needs those two terms to be equal to one. So to get it in that standard form, we wanna divide both sides by two. And if you do that, you will get y squared divided by eight plus z squared divided by six equals one, right? If you divide both sides by two, you end up multiplying these denominators by two. So four becomes eight and three becomes six. So now what we have here is another ellipse, but with different measurements for the distances in the y and z directions. All right, so the intercepts per se are y equals plus or minus the square root of eight and z equals plus or minus the square root of six. I already said that the square root of six is basically 2.4 as a decimal. So I'll write that down again, it's about 2.4, but then the square root of eight is about 2.8. So that's approximately 2.8. So those are the values I'm going to use on the 3D coordinate system here. And now we're ready to go. Let's start with the trace at x equals zero. We're going to draw that trace directly in the yz plane because that is where x would equal zero. Our y-intercepts are plus or minus two. So I'll say that this is positive two and this is negative two. And then for the z direction, we have 1.7 in either direction. So I'll say that positive 1.7 is right about there and negative 1.7 is right about there. Or you could think of those as plus or minus the square root of three. All right, but then we can draw our ellipse by connecting those intercepts. So we'll have something like this. And then we wanna draw our other two traces or our other two ellipses, which will be in the planes of x equals plus or minus the square root of six, which we said is about 2.4. So I'll say that x equals 2.4 is about right here. So we'll say x equals 2.4. And then in the other direction, x equals negative 2.4 will be right there. 
all right? And then at each of those values of x, we need to draw a projection of the yz plane, right? These traces are ellipses represented by this equation, which involves y and z. So those ellipses will be in planes parallel to the yz plane. Okay, specifically there in the planes, x equals plus or minus the square root of six. So we need to draw some new coordinate systems at those two points. We'll need a new z-axis at both of them, and we will need a new y-axis. Okay, so now we wanna label the intercepts on those coordinate systems for this ellipse. It's going to be the same ellipse in both coordinate systems at x equals 2.4 and x equals negative 2.4. In the y direction, we have the square root of eight or 2.8. So I'll say that this is y equals 2.8 and this is y equals negative 2.8. And then for the z direction, we have 2.4. So I'll say that this is z equals 2.4 and this is z equals negative 2.4. And then we'll do the same thing in this coordinate system. All right, and then we can draw our ellipses by connecting those intercepts. So we'll have an ellipse here, and we'll have an ellipse here. Okay, so now we have our two ellipses. They're not perfect. One looks a little bit bigger than the other, but that's my fault with my scaling. I didn't draw it perfectly, but it's close enough to get an idea of what this hyperboloid of one sheet will look like. What you want to do at this point now to complete the sketch is just draw a hyperbola, or in other words, a curve that connects these ellipses on both sides. So we'll have one curve that looks like this, and then another curve like this, okay? And then you can finalize your sketch by shading it in. And so there you have it. That is our sketch of this hyperboloid of one sheet. If you wanna compare it to a 3D render, here it is. This is what it would look like in 3D space. So hopefully your sketch looks pretty close to resembling that surface. You can see that just like we said it would, the hyperboloid is directed along the X axis. Okay, that is it for this surface. So let's move on to the next one. Next up, we wanna sketch the surface represented by this equation. We have nine X squared plus nine Y squared minus Z squared plus nine equals zero. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do here is identify the surface represented by this equation. First thing I see here is that we have three variables, X, Y, and Z, and all three of them are squared. So I'll make a note of that right away. We have all squared. And then it looks like one of them is negative, at least at first, right? That's your initial reaction to this equation. Oh, we have two positive variable terms and one negative, so it must be another hyperboloid of one sheet. But you have to be careful here. Look at the constant term. It's positive on this side of the equation. So if we were to try to get this equation in standard form, we would subtract that constant from both sides. So we would get something like this. We would have 9x squared plus nine y squared minus z squared equals negative nine, right? And so then if you were to try to get it into standard form where the variable terms would be equal to one, you would divide both sides of the equation by negative nine. So if you did that, you would have nine x squared divided by negative nine plus nine y squared divided by negative nine minus z squared divided by negative nine equals one. But now all of the signs are going to flip. They're going to change, right? What once was a positive x squared term will now be negative because nine divided by negative nine is negative one. You'll have negative x squared plus, or is it plus? We have nine y squared divided by negative nine. That will also be negative one. So that term will also be negative now. We'll have minus y squared. And then the z term was previously negative, but now we're dividing it by negative nine. So the negatives will cancel out and we will have plus z squared divided by nine equals one. So really we don't have one negative variable term. When we have the equation in standard form, you can see that there are two negative variable terms. So we have two negative terms, which is very important for us to realize here because now that we know that, along with the fact that there is a constant in this term, right, we have a constant, these three things together tell us that this is the equation of a hyperboloid of two sheets, all right? And the reason I know that is because all the variable terms are squared, two of them are negative and we have a constant, okay? If only one was negative and all those other conditions were met, it would be a hyperboloid of one sheet, but since we have two negative terms, it's a hyperboloid of two sheets, okay? And so now we can get started with sketching this surface. 
We already have our equation in standard form, which is great. That's really going to help us. What we want to do to sketch a hyperboloid of two sheets is actually find the intercepts along the direction axis. The intercepts would be for the two different sheets. But before we can do that, what is our direction axis? Well, remember, it's always based on the odd man out, right? We have two negative terms, but one positive term. So the positive term is the odd man out, which means that Z, the variable in the positive term, will be the axis of our direction or the direction axis. It will be the Z axis in this case. All right, so this hyperboloid will be directed along the Z axis. Okay, and so what that means is we wanna find the intercepts along the Z axis where our two sheets for this hyperboloid will extend from. And so to find that, we just have to set both of the other variables in the equation equal to zero. Okay, so if we set x equal to zero and y equal to zero, both of these two terms will become zero, right? So you're just going to be left with z squared divided by nine equals one. And if you solve for z here, you would multiply both sides by nine. So you'd have z squared is equal to nine, which if you take the square root of both sides, gives you that z is equal to plus or minus three. So the z intercepts for the two sheets of this hyperboloid will be at z equals positive and negative three. So I'm going to put that in our coordinate system right away here. I'll say that this is z equals three and this is z equals negative three. So that's good. We know that we're going to have a point there and there to extend our sheets from. But now we still need to find some traces to help us actually finish this sketch. And those traces will either be an ellipse or a circle. And the way we find those is by picking a nice value of z to plug into this equation and that will result in an ellipse equation, all right? You're always going to plug values in for the odd man out variable, all right? Our positive variable Z is the odd man out, so that's what we're gonna be plugging values into to get our traces, all right? Now, a nice value to plug in here, you might think, oh, well, let's plug three in, but we already did that, right? We already found that when Z is plus or minus three, those are just the intercepts of the sheets. You're not really going to get a trace for that, so instead we need to pick a value bigger than three. Okay, so three would have been nice because three squared divided by nine would have been a nice value of one, but we already found that when that's the case, X and Y would need to be zero. So we have to pick another value of Z here. I'm just trying to think of something that when you square it is divisible by nine. And the first thing that comes to mind for me would be six because six squared is 36 and 36 divided by nine is four. So that should work. If we let Z equal plus or minus six because we're going to do both of those values of z because they'll give us the same ellipse or the same circle whatever this happens to be and if that's the case the equation will be negative x squared minus y squared plus 36 divided by 9 right in both cases it doesn't matter if 6 is negative or positive if you square it you will get 36 and that will be equal to 1. now 36 divided by 9 like i said is 4 so you'd have positive 4 here and then you'd want to subtract it from both sides of the equation so over here you would have negative three. So this equation becomes negative x squared minus y squared equals negative three. But then all these values are negative. So we could just multiply everything by negative one and then everything would be positive and look more like an ellipse equation. All right, or more specifically in this case, it would be a circle, right? If we make all of our terms positive here, if we divide everything by negative one, you'll have x squared plus y squared equals three. And that's just the equation of a circle that has a radius of the square root of three. Okay, so that's a circle where r equals the square root of three, which is approximately 1.7 as a decimal. So what we wanna do is draw a circle with that radius in the planes at z equals positive and negative six. So let's work on that. Z equals positive six would be right about here, and z equals negative six would be down here. And then at those two points, what we wanna do is draw a projection of the xy plane so that we can draw these circles, right? This circle is an equation with x and y in it, so it will be located in a plane parallel to the xy plane, all right? So let's draw these new coordinate systems at z equals six and negative six. We will need a y-axis at both of them and an x-axis. And then let's label our radius. In each direction, it will be 1.7, or the square root of three. So we'll say that 1.7 is right about here, here, 
here and here for both the positive and negative x and y axes. And then we wanna do the same thing down here in this coordinate system. All right, now let's draw our circles. We just need to connect those intercepts. So we'll have a circle up here like this, and then a circle down here like this. Okay, now that we have those circles drawn, all we have left to do is draw two parabolas, or really we're drawing a hyperbola. One of the curves will start at this point and reach up to this circle, and the other curve will start at this point and reach down to this circle. Okay, so I'll draw it like this. This would be one sheet of the hyperboloid of two sheets, and this would be the second sheet. Okay, now if you shade it in, we have completed our sketch of this hyperboloid of two sheets. And so if you want to get a better visual of it, here is a 3D render of what this surface looks like in 3D space. You can clearly see the two sheets of this hyperboloid that are formed by the equation that we were given. Okay, let's take a look at one more example for this video. Okay, so for our last example, we want to sketch the surface of this equation. We have 6x equals 2y squared minus z squared. All right, so the first thing I notice about this equation is that we do have three variables. We have x, y, and z. And then something that really sticks out to me and should really stick out to you as well is that one of the variables is only to the power of one, right? We have two variables that are squared, y and z, but x is to the first power. When that is the case, when you have one variable of degree one and two variables of degree two, there's only two options of what that surface could be it's either an elliptic paraboloid or a hyperbolic paraboloid, okay? And the way we determine which of those two paraboloids this equation represents is by looking at the signs of the squared variable terms. If both of them were positive, we'd have an elliptic paraboloid, but in this case, one of them is positive and the other one is negative. So we have a hyperbolic paraboloid, all right? So here's what we know so far. We have two squared variable terms and one that is degree one, or in other words, one of them is to the first power, and we have one negative squared term and one positive squared term. So because of this information, we are able to conclude that this is a hyperbolic paraboloid, okay? And the equation that we've been given for this hyperbolic paraboloid is pretty much already in standard form. If you wanted to, you could divide both sides by six, and solve for x, but you don't really have to. We can work with this equation as it is to find some traces for this hyperbolic paraboloid. And the way I recommend that you go about finding these traces is to find the two parabola traces. In particular, those two parabolas will always be located in the coordinate planes that involve the variable that is to the first power, all right? Or in other words, the degree one variable. That variable also tells you the axis that you are directed along. So in this case, we would be directed along the X axis. That's not as important for this type of surface because it's kind of hard to wrap your head around which way the hyperbolic paraboloid would be facing if it's directed along a particular axis. It's not a usual shape. It's sort of an unusual type of surface, but it is important to know that X would be the direction axis anyway. So I will write that down. We are directed along the x axis and the two coordinate planes that are going to have our traces of parabolas will be the two planes that involve x so that would be the x y plane and the x z plane okay so those are the two planes that we want to find a trace for for this hyperbolic paraboloid and so let's start with the x y plane to find a trace in the x, y plane, we just want to work with the variables of x and y. So we want to set z equal to zero in this equation. So for the x, y plane, z would be equal to zero. And if we do that, we would have six x equals two y squared, right? The z term would become zero because zero squared is zero. So now we have an equation of a parabola. Let's solve for x explicitly though. If we divide both sides by x, we will get this equation. You'll have x is equal to y squared divided by three, right? Two divided by six would be one third. So x equals y squared divided by three. And what we want to do is find some points on this parabola, particularly two points that will help us graph it. We know it's going to be a parabola pointing in the positive x direction because it's x equals y squared divided by three and that term is positive. So we know it's going to be pointing in the positive x direction. 
where the vertex is at the origin because there is no value being added or subtracted from that y squared term, all right? If there was a minus three or a plus one or something like that, that means that the parabola would be shifted. But most likely, if you're going to graph a hyperbolic paraboloid, your equation is not going to come along with any shifts. I suppose it could happen, but most likely you won't see any constants on the end there. Okay, but let's find some points. Typically, I just pick a value of y that when plugged in simplifies nicely. In this case, if we let y equal three and negative three, you would square those two values and get nine and divide by three. So x would also equal three. Okay, so our two points here for this parabola would be three, three, zero, and three, negative three, zero. Okay, when y is three, you get three squared, which is nine divided by three. So x is three. And when y is negative three, negative three squared is also nine. So you have nine divided by three. So x would still be equal to three. All right, so those are two points for this parabola. Now let's find the parabola in the other plane involving our degree one variable of x, the variable of the axis we are directed along. And so that would be the x, z plane. The x, z plane would be where y is equal to zero, right? If the plane is involving x and z, then y would have to be zero. And when y is equal to zero, this term will just completely disappear from the equation. So we'll have 6x equals negative z squared. And then if we divide both sides by 6 to solve for x, we will get x equals negative z squared divided by 6. Okay, now I'm just going to split up my work here because I'm going to write some points here for this parabola as well. But this equation right here is a parabola, specifically a parabola that is in the xz plane and opening up towards the negative x-axis, okay? x equals tells us that we will be oriented along the x-axis, but the negative sign tells us that the parabola will be opening up towards the negative x-direction, okay? So now let's find two points on that parabola. Once again, just pick a nice value to plug in for z that will get you a nice x-coordinate. In this case, I'll just use six and negative six. So if we plug in six here, you'd get six squared, which would be 36, and then negative 36 divided by six is negative six. And the same thing would happen if you plug negative six in for z. Okay, so our two points are negative six, zero, six, and negative six, zero, negative six. All right, no matter if you plug six or negative six in for z, the corresponding x coordinate will be negative six. All right, and so now let's plot these points in our 3D coordinate system here, and then we can draw our parabolas and finish the sketch of this hyperbolic paraboloid. Let's start with the points in the xy plane. We have three, three, zero, and three, negative three, zero. First of all, let's label three and negative three for our x and y axes. I'll say that this is x equals positive three and x equals negative three, and then this will be y equals positive three and y equals negative three. So our first point is when both of those coordinates are positive to figure out where that point would be in this coordinate system. Remember that you wanna draw some lines parallel to the opposite axis from where you're starting. So if we're starting at the Y coordinate, we wanna draw a line parallel to the X axis, so like this. And then from the X coordinate, we wanna draw a line parallel to the Y axis, all right? So like this, and where those lines intersect is where the point would be. So that right there would be one of our points. And then our other point would be three, negative three, zero. So that's just when the Y coordinate is negative. So once again, let's draw our parallel lines. Here's our line parallel to the X axis from Y equals negative three. And then our line parallel to the Y axis from X equals three would be right there. And so those lines meet right here. So that's where that point would be. And now this is for our parabola in the X, Y plane. And so we can now create that parabola by starting at the origin and connecting to those two points. Okay, so here's half of our parabola. We'll draw it like that. And then the other half will look something like this. Okay, so now let's work on the other parabola that would be in the x, z plane. We have these two points to plot. We're gonna be working with x and z coordinates, negative six and positive six. So I'll say that this is x equals negative six. This is x equals positive six and then this is z equals positive six and z equals negative six. Okay, for the first point, we have negative six as the x coordinate and then positive six as the z coordinate. So we're going to be working back here somewhere. We'll draw some parallel lines from our coordinates. So draw a line parallel to the z axis 
to the x coordinate, and then draw a line parallel to the x axis from the z coordinate. And where those two lines would meet is where that point will be. And then we'll do the same thing for the other coordinate point. We have negative six as the x coordinate once again, but now negative six for the z coordinate as well. So that's going to be down here somewhere. All right, so draw a line parallel to the z axis from the x coordinate and draw a line parallel to the x axis from the z coordinate. And where those two lines meet is where that point will be. Okay, so now we can draw our other parabola. It's going to start at the origin and be in the x, z plane connecting these two points. So let's draw it. Here's one half of the parabola. It'll look like that. And then the other half will look like this. Okay, so that'll do. Those are the two parabolas that would be traces for this hyperbolic paraboloid. Now, here's where things can get a little bit tricky. This is probably the hardest part of sketching a hyperbolic paraboloid. The other traces for a hyperbolic paraboloid, the traces parallel to the other plane we did not work with, so that would be the yz plane, would all be hyperbolas. Now, we don't have to find equations for those hyperbolas. We're just trying to draw a sketch here. These two parabolas are going to be enough. All we need to do for each of those parabolas is draw hyperbolas at their ends such that they are parallel to the axis not involved in the plane for the parabolas. So for this parabola right here, which is in the xy plane, right? This is the parabola for the xy plane. The axis not being used is the z axis. So we wanna draw a hyperbola parallel to that z axis. Or in other words, we wanna draw the curves such that if they were flattened, they would be parallel to the z axis. All right, so we're gonna have a hyperbola that looks something like this. All right, we'll have a curve going this way and then a curve going this way. Okay, it looks like a mess right now, but things will work out. Now for the other parabola, this one is in the x, z plane. So the axis not being used is the y axis. So we're going to draw a hyperbola parallel to the y axis at the ends of this parabola. So that will look something like this, all right? And when I say parallel, once again, I'm just saying that if those curves were flattened, they would be parallel to the y axis, okay? And then once you have those drawn in, all you have to do now is sort of connect the dots or connect the hyperbolas. Each curve for a hyperbola will be connected to the other two curves for the other hyperbola. So if we start with this curve, we're not going to connect it to this one because that's from the same hyperbola, but I will connect it to these two curves because they're from the other hyperbola. So I'm going to draw a line here and I'll draw a line here. Then for this one, we need to connect it to the bottom of those two curves. So we'll draw a line here and a line here. And that's about it. That's gonna do it for this sketch of the hyperbolic paraboloid. It doesn't really look so good right now, but if I shade it in, it will look a little bit better. And so now that I've done that, the hyperbolic paraboloid pops out a little bit more. It's not great, it's not a perfect drawing, but it gets the point across about the shape of that surface. You can still see that saddle shape going on here. This is sort of the underneath side. It's not the easiest thing to visualize in two dimensions. So once again, just like with all the other examples, here's a 3D render of this surface in 3D space. This should help you make sense of the picture that I just drew in my 3D coordinate system. And if you were following along, it should make your drawing make a little bit more sense as well. Even if your drawing isn't great, at least now you get an idea of what it should look like if you are working in three dimensions. All right, but with that, this was the last example for this video. However, I do have one more example available on my membership site. So if that's something that interests you, feel free to look into becoming a member. You can get more details at jkmathematics.com plus. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, then this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.